so good that you are here. Thank you very much. And we are very honored that you are here. And let me just short in, uh, shortly introduce Wolfgang Meyerhofer. Um, Wolfgang Meyerhofer will um, uh, pose the questions and um, talk to Arne Kalleberg. And he's a professor of management at the University, Vienna University of Economics and Business. And um, he has written a large number of very fine publications, too, on um, comparative international human resource management and leadership on work careers. Um, and he, too, has received uh, several national and international rewards for outstanding research and um, service to the academic community. So we look forward to a very interesting, uh, interesting um, conversation, I think. Um, I'm happy that both of you are here and um, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dorothea, uh, uh, and uh, welcome also from my side, Anne. Uh, Dorothea already outlined, I think, the basic uh, concept, uh, uh, and uh, we might or might not uh, maybe slightly deviate uh, from uh, the order or from the type of questions, uh, but we'll play it by ear. Uh, in one of the previous sessions, we had uh, uh, a, a, a quite lively debate uh, about uh, uh, the seeming uh, difference uh, uh, or actual difference between collective uh, and corporate intentions, which I think leads very nicely to the more basic question of uh, corporate personhood, uh, so corporations as legal persons. Uh, uh, so, from your point of view, Arne, I mean, who've been who has been studying that uh, for a long time, uh, so then what is meant by this corporate personhood uh, thing, and why do you think is this concept uh, relevant for studying organizations? Well, thank you very much for that very nice introduction, uh, Dorothea, and thank you, uh, Wolfgang. It's great to meet you, and thank to everybody who's on this talk. I'm sorry I'm not in Hamburg, uh, but uh, you know. Um, if I was in Hamburg, I'd probably be in quarantine anyway. So it's nice to be here. Um, yes, corporate personhood um, is uh, basically the legal notion that corporation has a distinct um, ex existence from the people who make it up, the managers, the uh, owners, the employees, and so on. And this uh, separatistness is uh, inherent in what we mean by an organization, uh, by a corporation, I mean. Uh, and... Um, more than that, though, it implies that the corporation has some legal rights and responsibilities that are similar to that uh, held by natural persons or individual people. Uh, and uh, as uh, in many countries uh, in the U.S. as well as in Europe, uh, in most countries, uh, corporations as legal persons have a right to enter into contracts uh, with other parties. They can sue in court uh, the same way uh, natural persons and unincorporated uh, associations of persons do. Um, Margaret Blair, who is a uh, law professor, uh, basically identified four functions of corporate personhood. Uh, it ensures its continuity and succession and uh, property. It provides mechanisms for separating the assets of the corporation from uh, the participating individuals, and that removes individuals from liability. If the company goes bankrupt, you don't. Uh, and it provides a governance um, a framework for business and commercial activity. Now, in addition, those are not those are not very controversial. But the fourth one is more controversial, and that's the idea that the corporation as a person has an identifiable persona, which is an, an identity which is distinct from the people who make it up. And these functions of corporate personhood enable uh, the corporation to uh, achieve its various functions. Now, why is this important? Well, um, its relevance for organizational theory is quite profound because it has to do with the role uh, of understanding the theoretical nature of what corporations and organizations are. And uh, just very briefly in the US, corporate law uh, basically has gone through three phases. Uh, in terms of understanding what corporations are. Uh, initially, uh, we had this artificial entity view, which was that corporations were chartered by either the king, uh, when there was a king, or the state. That we have different states in the US that can charter corporations. And as a result, the corporation was a creature of the state and was subject to the regulations of the state. Um, and it really didn't have an existence separate from that. Well, as corporations got bigger in the United States in the uh, 19th, 19th century, um, more and more co co 
corporations became incorporated. And so that was replaced by a view that says that the contractual theory, which basically says that corporations are not creatures of the state, but an aggregate of the shareholders and the members who make it up. And that worked for a while, but then when corporations got really big in the late 19th century, uh, then a new theory came in, which was the real entity theory, which argued that the corporation was an organic reality with an existence independent of and constituting something distinct from the, the, the changing nature of the uh, participants. Now, the corporations as person idea came through, started really in the, uh, in the contractual theory, but really reached its heyday in the, um, in the uh, real entity theory. Uh, and so by the uh, 1920s in the United States, uh, really it was assumed that we knew what corporations were and there was no more debate. And it was not until the mid 1980s that corporations uh, what they mean and the idea of corporate personhood became more controversial. And I think we'll be discussing that as we go through. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, you uh, repeatedly pointed out, and uh, uh, I think very rightly so, uh, uh, in America, in the United States, uh, etc., pointing towards a very specific context, and I think which, uh, which opens up, uh, I think, a number of questions. Uh, the first, uh, most likely, being uh, well, what are the legal uh, rights uh, in that specific North American, especially US American uh, context, but also the question, I mean, we are largely at least a European audience, uh, what do you see as contextual specifics uh, uh, of uh, the United States? Uh, are there any universalist uh, elements that you see and from your angle, and I mean, you've got the broad angle, uh, is there anything that uh, uh, that you see in terms of Europe? Europe's always, I mean, Europe and Europe, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> are two different pairs of shoes, as we say in German, which probably doesn't translate into English. Uh, so, what, what, what uh, do you have any views on that? Uh, uh, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Uh, well, just briefly, in the United States, um, the idea that corporations are persons uh, was. Uh, characteristic of the beginning of the American Republic. Uh, this was uh, a, um, a, uh, an idea that was taken from, um, from Europe, from England in particular. Uh, and um, so the, the idea of corporate personhood is rooted in the constitution, which granted um, uh, corporations a number of legal rights. And these rights were affirmed and, 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 and reaffirmed through a series of US Supreme Court just uh, decisions uh, historically. Uh, just as a couple of examples uh, of, of the rights that corporations have under the Constitution of the United States, uh, the Fourth Amendment that protects the right of people to be secure in their persons, houses, uh, papers and effects against unreasonable search and seizures. Now, without that, uh, it would be lawful, for example, for the government to search the offices of a uh, of a business without a warrant. Um, the 14th Amendment, which was passed right after the Civil War in the 1860s, um, uh, was uh, designed to give um, uh, all persons equal protection under the law. It was designed to protect slaves, but it was extended to, uh, to persons, to uh, corporations. Uh, and this kind of uh, uh, legal right uh, and it means that uh, we can't have laws that discriminate against an owner of a corporation based on his or her gender or race or uh, religion or any other uh, protected characteristic. Uh, now, this is not to say that corporations have the same rights as individuals, nor should they. I mean, for example, corporations can't die. And so therefore they can't be heirs and there can't be that kind of thing. Corporations cannot get drafted into the military. Um, uh, so there are certain things you cannot do, but, um, but basically um, uh, these are the kinds of things that, um, uh, but they have the right to property, they have the right to sue and so on. Now, uh, the idea that corporations are persons then uh, is fairly uncontroversial because corporations need these rights in order to do business. Um, but in recent years in the United States, this has become a very political issue. 
Uh, and it started really, uh, the, big, the big blow up came in 2012 when Mitt Romney was running for president against uh, Barack Obama. And he made the statement in Iowa saying, corporations are people, my friends. Um, and uh, this caused a, a major blowback among, uh, among progressives, which said, of course, they're not people. Uh, they're, uh, they're inanimate things. Uh, and so the idea of personhood uh, applied to corporations became political. Now, there were two cases in particular that are very famous that I should mention that sort of created this, helped create this controversy. One was the famous Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission in 2010. Uh, Citizens United was a, um, a conservative nonprofit organization which sought to um, uh, put on, on television and, and advertising a, uh, a film critical of the presidential candidate in 20, uh, 2008, which was Hillary Clinton. And this was a violation of some campaign laws which said that you can't uh, air um, uh, communications like that uh, at a certain time before the, uh, before the election. And this led to a Supreme Court case that was decided 5-4 and basically argued that it prohibited that uh, a uh, prohibiting uh, companies from airing these kinds of ads was a violation of free speech. And as a result of that, what the unintended consequence was to give corporations unlimited ability to uh, spend money on, on, um, on campaigns. And that's led to a real crisis in the US as people have led to have, people have uh, uh, um, corporations have spent a lot of money campaigning, which is a threat to democracy. Now, in my view, it's not so much the, uh, the problem here uh, was not so much that corporations shouldn't be persons. It was the idea that spending on campaigns is really free speech. And that I think is the, the legal issue. The second one is called uh, Hobby Lobby versus Burwell in 2014. And um, the case came about because there was a, 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 st a, a store in the United States, a group of stores called Hobby Lobby, which makes hobby stuff, uh, you can make crafts and things. And they, um, they were very religious people, the Greens who owned it. And the Obama uh, healthcare law had a stipulation in there that it, companies had to provide contraceptive services to uh, employees. And this offended the Greens because they are religious and a contraception was against that. And so again, in a 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court ruled that, uh, that they had a right to do this and that it would be an infringement on their uh, political, uh, on their religious beliefs. Now, these kinds of, uh, of, of extensions of rights strikes me as being more extensive than it is the case in other countries and in Europe, for example, and probably they are too extensive. But in Europe, there, is, uh, there are both Europe, EU, European Union rights of corporations uh, enforced by the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Justice, which provide certain rights for, for corporations. And there are country specific rights. Um, and the fundamental rights that corporations have in all these countries, probably in all uh, democratic countries in the world, is uh, they have certain essential rights that are fundamental to their uh, function. The right to property, the right to uh, run a business, um, and, uh, and freedom of expression. Now, an example of where this is violated was um, was uh, in Russia, where Yukos, the uh, oil company, was basically taken over by the government because the leader of the country didn't like the politics of the leader of, uh, of Yukos. That's an example of violation of, uh, of, uh, of, of rights. And uh, that is also the case in, um, in Europe, where you have these basic rights. You have the right to uh, freedom of expression, freedom of correspondence, uh, rights to occupational freedom, and of course the rights to property. These are fundamental because corporations cannot operate without them. Now my understanding is that in Europe, Germany appears to have been on the forefront of uh, when it comes to uh, conferring constitutional rights on companies. I'll have a little more to say about that later, but this is something I think uh, those folks, you folks on the uh, on the ch on the um, on the call today, might uh, help us learn because you guys are more expert on this than than I am for certainly, and you might indicate um, uh, what what specific kinds of rights are or not the case and how that differs from the U.S. At this point, let me uh, suffice it to say that. Uh, 
the kinds of rights that many corporations have in the United States might be um, exorbitant and they might go too far, especially uh, in the case of Citizens United, which has become a real uh, sticking point in the United States. Yeah, thanks, Arne. Um, just uh, to the audience uh, and as a, um, a slight modification, uh, just to remind you, Dorothea, uh, as said, well, put uh, any questions in the chat. I mean, this needs not necessarily be polished <coughs> German business uh, school professor questions, but could be just uh, kind of two, three remarks uh, 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 that uh, you just indicate that you want to make a comment or something like that. So feel free to do that uh, uh, in, in, in one way or other. Uh, coming back to, uh, to the um, uh, personhood uh, and the rights uh, thing, we had a very interesting uh, discussion in the earlier part uh, in the a blue stream. We have a blue and red stream. I was wondering about hmm, Democrats, Republicans, but no, <laughs> probably not really, uh, just blue and red. Uh, in the blue stream uh, with a, a, a very heavy critique on corporate social responsibility and some of the aspects there, which I think leads to the broader question of uh, uh, does or imply personhood uh, something in terms of responsibilities for corporations. So what are the implications? Uh, uh, what, are, what follows from that? Well, that's a, that's a great point. And that certainly is a, a very timely topic, uh, cor uh, corporate social responsibility th these days. Uh, if you're going to think about corporations as persons, we have to also think about the obligations of uh, and the responsibilities of corporations in addition to their rights. Uh, and uh, here, uh, I think uh, the current thinking about um, what corporations are, namely the contract theory, which I believe we'll be discussing in a minute, um, uh, has a real, uh, has a real um, blind sight and blind, uh, blinders in a way, because it focuses mainly on the rights of shareholders. Now, shareholders, of course, their rights uh, need to be protected. But um, there are other obligations besides that. And so... Um, uh, and you can't, you've got to think about corporate responsibilities as being more than simply uh, doing what you need to do for the shareholders. Um, uh, an advantage of having the corporate form is that um, corporations are, have deep pockets and they're able to, um, to uh, uh, address many social ills. And thinking now of the, uh, the deep water horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico a number of years ago. Uh, there, that caused billions and billions of dollars of damage. In, there are very few individuals in the world, maybe now because of the pandemic, that some of these people's salaries, uh, wealth has gone up, but very few people can afford to pay that kind of money, but corporations can. Now, much of the justification for giving corporations rights in the first place is the assumption that um, their democratic expressions of their stakeholders' views. And so the idea is that corporations should be relatively democratic and therefore expressing the views of not only the shareholders, but also other stakeholders. Now, one way to make these uh, obligations operational and to maybe cure the ills of things like Citizens United is to make corporations more like persons rather than less. And here, I think the case of Germany is a very interesting and instructive example of uh, the idea of co-determination in which uh, representatives of labor as well as uh, a business and other stakeholders are, are on the board. Uh, and this creates a situation where um, you have uh, an, a, a representation of um, of, uh, of many interests, not only the shareholders. So the idea that corporations do not have consciousness, a conscience, they don't have conscience. And if you let the corporations act the way they want to act sometimes, they will act uh, in a way that will focus on only the shareholders and increase profits. But if you make, if you require them to become more democratic and to provide some uh, input uh, to, from other stakeholders, this will create, um, uh, reforms that will basically enable 
organizations to act more responsibly, to take care of the externalities that are, that are created by the corporations. Uh, and, um, and it will make, uh, it, will, it will actually, um, it will make corporations more like people. Uh, and I must say that uh, for those who might say this uh, is a problem because it's going to take away from the shareholders, I would say, no, look at Germany. Germany has done quite well with their uh, economic, uh, with their co-determination. Uh, Germany uh, has been and still is, uh, to, to, to my understanding, the economic powerhouse of Europe. And uh, it provides German companies with a comparative advantage. So... Um, the idea that uh, corporate social responsibility is an obligation makes sense, and it does fit in with the idea of corporations as persons. Um, and just like people, you know, people have a multitude of interests. You know, not everybody is interested only in making money. Maybe some people are, like our former president, perhaps. But 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 most people have a multi multitude of interests. They are they are they are they are family people. They have uh, citizenship uh, concerns. They like sports and so on. So having corporations more like that by becoming more democratic and and being sensitive to stakeholders strikes me as a way of um, and, and and that would be a way of, of reform that would make corporations more like people. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I mean, uh, this the, the whole issue of rights and uh, uh, and responsibilities uh, uh, kind of forms, uh, I, I think, an interesting uh, 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 kind of relationship. We've got we have, we have two, two two questions in the chat, uh, which uh, I think directly relate uh, uh, to that. One question from Lisa Herzog is, uh, well, um, and you mentioned that uh, uh, the, the the kind of uh, extreme protection of free speech uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, the the question of, that is put up is, is to say hmm, uh, uh, this is uh, the political power of corporations to kind of rein it in to kind of limit it uh, is uh, kind of that's a very very difficult issue because of this uh, constitutional right uh, uh, and status of uh, free speech uh, uh, and the question is, do you think that might change uh, in, in, in the future, uh, uh, this kind of uh, thing? And, uh, or do you see alternative ways uh, uh, of uh, uh, reigning in, uh, again, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the, in the way which corporations currently, uh, and for a long time now, actually influence the public uh, discourse? And as a disclaimer to all the others, if you feel yourself grossly misunderstood how I interpret your question, please uh, just uh, and say, no, you're all wrong and put the right one. To, to, uh, <laughs> just go ahead, Anna, please. Well, thank you for that question. That's a very good one. Uh, I don't think Citizens United is going to be uh, overturned anytime soon. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, court has got more conservative now uh, with the uh, recent additions. So that's not going to happen. But I think what could happen is if if organizations could be made more democratic, then their, um, their uh, uh, participation in, in uh, the nation's political debate is less of a concern. The, the problem is that the corporations are pretty autocratic in the United States right now, uh, and they're run by shareholders. And as a result, uh, that becomes problematic. But it seems to me the problem with Citizens United, as I briefly mentioned, is not so much the issue of free speech, but is the idea that um, does spending money on politics necessarily constitute free speech? Uh, and one way to address the issue would be to put limits on what, uh, as there are limits on what individuals can contribute to political campaigns uh, in the United States anyway, so too we could put limits on what corporations could spend. Now the problem is you have these uh, P, uh, po political action committees or PACs in which uh, are theoretically supposed to not be associated with a given candidate to which unlimited amounts of money can be uh, spent. And uh, of course, while you're not endorsing specifically a specific person, you are endorsing a party or a certain perspective and that is amounts to the same thing. So I don't think the problem is so much free speech. I think the problem is the autocratic nature of organizations Co-determination would be a good move in that direction to create more corporate responsibility, and the idea that um, that we need to put some limits on corporate uh, on on campaign spending by individuals or by corporations. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And and, and Claudia Meisterscheid, uh, she uh, she asked. 
uh, which I think leads uh, uh, on to an even more fundamental question is, uh, is uh, how far is the idea that corporations uh, are persons, uh, is, is that taken from England and the, the kind of concepts uh, that, uh, that are there? So is there any, any kind of uh, uh, blueprint, so to say, uh, uh, where this comes from? My understanding is that uh, much of it is rooted in English common law and in the uh, in the tradition. I mean, the uh, the Americans when they came, uh, when people settled America, it was originally settled by corporations and so on. So this idea of personhood um, is uh, uh, strikes me as a fairly um, going back to um, historical times before before the before Europe. Uh, back to, to uh, ancient times, it would seem to me, that the idea that corporation, but in a way, corporate personhood is really um, uh, intrinsic in the meaning of what a corporation is. You get a group of people together, whether or not it's for profit making purposes or for uh, other purposes, they create an entity which is distinct from the individuals that participate in them. Uh, and that strikes me, while this is not necessarily accepted by some theories, which I think we'll discuss next, um, it is basically uh, intrinsic to the idea of what a corporation is, and it does go back a long way. It's not, it's not an American idea. Okay. Um, two other questions uh, uh, to up uh, to what we've discussed uh, now. Rutger Klassen uh, uh, asks, hmm, democratization as one of the uh, potential uh, kind of remedies uh, uh, for what you, you said, uh, would you see benefit corporations foreshadowing uh, such a, a, a thing towards uh, such a move uh, towards more democratic corporations? Uh, uh, and I literally just read it, uh, have they so far been successful in trading off financial and ecological social purposes in your view? Uh, Leo Strine, Colin Meyer, others have called for making the benefit status mandatory. Um, what's your view on that? Are I guess you... I'm not familiar with the term benefit corporation. Yeah, Could... that's... Uh, 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 Rutka, could you briefly explain what you, uh, what you mean by that? So this is a separate corporate statute that uh, a number of American states have introduced over the last 10 years. Um, in the UK, I think you have something similar with community interest companies and the, the French recently introduced the Société à Mission. And, and all these forms are, uh, yeah, are sort of taken to be forms that uh, could well suit social enterprises um, who from the start want uh, to make a decent profit, but also spend more of their resources on social and ecological purposes broadly conceived. And some think this could shift the whole corporate landscape in a new direction if this kind of status would become more widespread or even mandatory. Others would say, well, it's exactly a niche which allows the general corporate landscape to focus on profit maximization and, and to continue doing so. Yeah, well, that sounds like a really nice, nice idea. Uh, I'm not sure how, how wide, how scalable it is uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a capitalist society. Um, more and more companies uh, under pressure from pension plans and so on are... Uh, investing in socially responsible investing in that sense. Um, but it seems to me that uh, it's going to be uh, a long, a long time before our major corporations, our Googles, our Apples, and so on can be convinced to do this kind of um, uh, activity. Um, so I think it's a nice model. Uh, I think, um, I think there's a danger in letting um, political um, decisions uh, dominate too much the uh, the uh, the form that corporations can take because corporations are going to follow what they see as a profitable thing. But I think as more and more people become aware of the climate change, of the the externalities that are created by many of these corporate policies that are focused on profit exclusively, uh, I think more and more there's going to be pressure put on companies to act in a more uh, benefit way. I'm not sure they'd be classified that way, but certainly I think that's a direction which, uh, uh, and the internet really helps that to some extent, you know, you can shame companies easier now than you used to, for example. And I, so I think there's a, uh, there's, there's a possibility there, but I don't see a, a, a wholesale change in that direction, at least not in the United States, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, thanks, Anne. And maybe a final question from the audience, from Wenzel uh, Matiaske, uh, what we discussed, because he was wondering, uh, uh, and that's, uh, uh, I think, a very fair point. Uh, hmm, are the differences that we looked uh, and that you addressed between the US and Europe, so part of Europe, 
Is it more the uh, kind of uh, geographic uh, uh, US versus Europe uh, and whatever is linked to that thing? Or is it the difference between Roman law and common law uh, and the idea uh, uh, that uh, uh, the ideas that flow from that? Uh, so, so is it, is it a kind of the, the, the basically very different approaches uh, to law? Yeah. Uh, uh, what's, what's the role there? Uh, that I'm not, I don't think I'm all that capable of answering that question, basically. Uh, I, I do think that the, uh, the Supreme Court decisions that, uh, that uh, basically pushed this uh, idea uh, to probably an extreme has uh, really influenced um, um, uh, the, way this, the way this has happened uh, to some extent. And I think it, a lot of it has to do with, uh, I mean, the United States, uh, because of its, um, of its, uh, the way it, the, the, the capitalism is developed, the way the welfare system is set up and so on really. Uh, okay. But I'm not quite sure I can really, uh, maybe somebody else could try to educate us more about the Roman law versus the common law distinction. If, if we have some time in the end, I'll address Wenzel directly and then uh, he can Great. kind of <laughs> give his view. Uh, that's it for it, Wenzel, actually. Uh, uh, but I mean, up to now, we have uh, more or less uh, kind of uh, taken uh, the, the, uh, the, the concept of person for granted. But I mean, if you take a closer look at, uh, well, what do we actually mean by, uh, uh, by person? Uh, so, um, uh, um, this uh, uh, and organizations as persons, uh, 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 and that's uh, that's uh, that's a very different story. Then, if you look at uh, 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 concepts that uh, uh, kind of coming from economic theories, uh, see corporations as nexus uh, uh, of contracts, things like that. Uh, so, what's your what's your view on uh, uh, on this uh, conceptualization? Organizations as, as persons organizations is nexus of contracts, organizations maybe even is something else. Uh, how does that compare? Yeah, a good question. Uh, yeah, so in the mid 80s, um, uh, it actually started in the, in, the, in the 70s in the United States, uh, there was a, 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 a sea change in the way capitalism uh, operated. Uh, uh, the, the, and uh, there was an increase in globalization, technological change, decline in unions, increase in individual, individualism and so on. But basically the idea was that companies had to become more competitive in order to ad address uh, issues in the world economy and to, be comp and to compete in the world economy. Uh, here's a case where, and so companies wanted to become more flexible. They wanted to be more, uh, they wanted to get rid of their fixed costs they wanted to be more nimble, as they say. Uh, and this happened to coincide with, um, uh, with economic theories uh, coming out of business economics and finance. Uh, uh, and, the, and, the, and the exemplar paper here is the, uh, is the Jensen and Meckling paper in 1976, which basically introduced the idea and popularized that, the comp that a corporation is simply nothing more than a collection of uh, contracts among shareholders, employees, directors, suppliers. It's a nexus of contract among, um, among, among those who participate in the organization. And so as a result, uh, if you believe that, and if you buy that, and that fit the, that fit the time, uh, to some extent, it fits the description of organizations as more, as more networks as, as, as opposed to, as opposed to uh, uh, hierarchies. Uh, and it does describe, um, it does describe what uh, many of us think about many of the corporations today. Uh, but if you buy that view, um, and uh, then basically the idea of um, the firm as an individual entity that uh, has a, a single objective, that has a distinct identity, uh, that becomes less useful. And um, uh, basically, if you, the contract, the nexus of contract view sees that any consideration of corporate personhood, uh, reputation, culture, uh, uh, brands uh, are really not relevant to organizational analysis because they are, uh, corporations are really the collection of contracts. Now, the, the nexus of contract view does accomplish three of the four functions of, of corporations, of, of per corporate personhood that I mentioned earlier. You still have continuity of property and succession. You still have assets that are separate from the individuals who, uh, who occupy the work in the organization, and you still have a governance mechanism. What it doesn't have is the, the persona component. And the persona component um, 
is, I think, very important. And it's just as important today as it was in the 20th century. Um, to try to explain corporations simply in contract terms seems to uh, not acknowledge what many corporations actually try to do. Um, for example, um, uh, some of the most va uh, successful value creating businesses uh, in the uh, 21st century, and I'm thinking now of, of the tech companies, the, the Googles and the Facebooks and, the, uh, uh, and, and, and so on, they have place a great deal of importance on culture, on brand, on, um, on innovativeness. And, um, and, so the, and so the idea that these companies uh, are really simply a bundle of contracts in which people compete to find um, uh, an equilibrium that would guide their actions strikes me as not very uh, compatible with what these companies are actually doing because brand has become increasingly important. So I think uh, the nexus of contract theory has been useful in many ways. Uh, it's led to a whole bunch of, of consequences. It's led to changes in compensation package, packages because of you want to tie the uh, interests of the agent more closely to that of the principals, the owners, by giving them stock options and everything. It's, it's in increased inequality enormously. But what it has done, I think, is to deflect our attention away from the idea that corporations are actors that do act in certain ways and have cultures and persona that uh, distinguish them from other corporations. Thanks. Um, following up on what you said uh, now about the persona, but also uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, reminding me on one of uh, uh, my first aha moments as a very young uh, business administration student uh, when we took a sociology course uh, and one of the instructors said, uh, you don't, uh, not literally, but uh, kind of uh, uh, basically said, well, if you ever think about any kind of social setting without power, uh, you lose uh, uh, and you are not, uh, you lose the kind of most important uh, thing, although it's not always visible, but you lose the most important uh, uh, dimension of analysis and uh, the, the dimension that uh, helps you to understand the situation and that for, uh, as, as you might imagine, uh, for a young business administration student coming straight from school, this was saying, hey, uh, power, uh, this is, uh, well, I'm, I'm here at the, at the Wirtschaftsuniversität, uh, uh, so uh, the question of power, I think, uh, uh, seems to be uh, 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 inevitably linked to that. So, uh, and this corporate personhood, uh, what uh, what relation do you see there uh, between corporate uh, personhood and corporate power? I mean, uh, uh, in yeah. a, in a different way. Well, first let me say that was a great question. First, let me say um, corporate power is very difficult to define, uh, and this it's a, one of those concepts which we know is important but we really don't know exactly what it is. And it's often used as, sh as a shorthand for something that we don't really know, but it's a, a convenient convenient term. I mean, we know it exists, but what is it is harder to know. The first thing I wanna say is that the corporate power depends on the corporate form. And so in the 20th century, when we had these large corporations, uh, the mainly manufacturing industries and so on, corporate power was based on size, in terms of generally in terms of number of employees uh, and in terms of control over markets uh, as in oligopolies or monopolies and so on. Well, as the corporate, that corporate form has really evolved or disappeared or changed into what we have now, which is more of a network form in which uh, companies no longer have to own um, uh, employees or assets. They can basically uh, subcontract them out uh, through various means. Uh, the idea of size becomes, uh, in terms of the number of employees, becomes less less meaningful, uh, and um, and so companies today are increasingly short lived. They're increasingly unstable. They're increasingly uh, uh, provisional. Uh, so one might argue that the, the idea of corporate personhood um, is uh, no longer relevant at now as it was back in the 20th century, where brand was very important because you wanted to sell stuff that you manufactured. And so the GM company, the Ford and so on was very important. But I would argue that 
uh, even though companies have changed, even though we are more in a network form of organization, which do resemble nexus of contracts in many ways, the idea of persona is still in incredibly important to the idea of power. In order, to, um, in order to have a positive image in the public, which can be uh, a challenged because of the uh, social media and because of the internet, uh, and so on, it seems to me that, that the idea of a, of a brand is still very, very important. And, uh, and so uh, while, the, while what causes uh, organization power, the, the, the elements of it changes, um, the, the fact that um, persona is necessary for the exercise of power strikes me as still very much the case. Thank you very much. Um, I've got uh, uh, one final question. Uh, since uh, if, uh, if one looks at the audience, uh, 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 there are uh, some old farts like ourselves who look back, uh, uh, but there are a number of uh, participants in the, in the audience uh, who uh, kind of uh, might grapple with the question uh, uh, something like, hmm, if I set out uh, to an academic uh, career and I want to be not only objectively successful, uh, reputation-wise, etc., but I want to lead a fulfilling uh, uh, life and academic career, do you have any recommendation for uh, them, for us old-timers, it might lead to regret? Yeah, uh, I, should have, <laughs> I should have listened to Arne before. Okay, yeah, great, yeah. Uh, well, but I'll, I'll take the risk, but for, for the younger ones, uh, uh, this might have a real impact. So any views on that, Arne? Yeah, well, I, thank you for asking. Uh, it assumes I have something to say, uh, uh, <laughs> which I think is, is problematic. But um, so uh, you know, obviously, uh, in terms of a fulfilling life, uh, life is more than work. Uh, uh, family and health are, are to the bedrocks of whatever successful life one might have. And, and that kind of is, 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 is a necessary condition. Uh, but in terms of work, um, I, I guess the one thing I look back on and uh, would encourage people to do is to focus on things that you find interesting, important, and fulfilling to do. Do things for intrinsic rewards, um, not only extrinsic rewards. Now, of course, I like extrinsic rewards too, like everybody else does. But you know, I got into sociology because I was interested in understanding certain problems. In particular, in my case, it was why people took jobs that were above their qualifications. I couldn't figure out why when I hear all this stay in school, get a good job business. So I wanted to go to sociology to understand that. And over time, in the last, uh, you know, and too many years, now. Um, I have focused on different issues that uh, I find interesting and important and uh, I want to know the answers to. And that's, I think, one of the beauties of the academic life, which is that, you know, you got to do th certain things. You got to go to meetings. You got to publish. You got to do this and that. Uh, but uh, the ability to basically engage with um, social issues and social problems and to make um, maybe not make a difference in terms of uh, actually the way things change but to help understand things is it to me is, is is valuable in and of itself and I find that incredibly fulfilling and I really enjoy uh, writing, uh, research, uh, teaching and talking, traveling around and talking to people about learning how they live and so on. So understanding society and, and so on, whether or not it's organizations or whether or not it's an, I, I'm particularly focused right now on inequality, why that has grown and how that's related to organizations. I think that's incredibly important to try to understand because there's so much misinformation out there and people really listen to what they believe in, in, in what certain media and they, so I think Social scientists have a real important role to play by sort of understanding what's really going on. And I think we could do that. And I find that incredibly fulfilling. And uh, so thank you for asking. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. I think uh, anything uh, beyond that would just, uh, uh, any other words would just kind of destroy what you just said. Thanks very much kind of for sharing your insight uh, on, the, uh, on the last question, but also of course, the kind of many other insights, and I think on behalf of, uh, of, of the Old Assembly, uh, thanks very much. We can give uh, a, a kind of uh, clap, uh, uh, knocking, whatever the appropriate uh, response is. Uh, uh, thanks uh, uh, very much, and uh, uh, looking forward to kind of talking to you and meeting you in the in real, in real, uh, with the uh, uh, in Hamburg or in Austria, wherever. Thanks uh, very much. Uh,
That would be wonderful. Thank you very much, everybody.